So I'm Katin Satnara. I'm the co-convener of the Inns of Court Alliance for Women on behalf of Middle Temple. And on behalf of ICAR, um, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you all this evening in Middle Temple Hall. I um, really appreciate the effort that people have made um, to commit to this evening. Uh, and I just met someone that's uh, made it all the way down from Manchester uh, to join the evening. Um, so at the outset, because it's often left to the end, I really want to thank the INS uh, teams that have worked really hard, the admin team, to get this event together. It's an awful lot of work to get an event like this put together. So Kate Peters from um, Inner Temple, Lily Young, uh, Emma Marlow, uh, uh, Gabriel Dory from Middle Temple, as well as Laura Hakon, Claire Coveney from Lincoln's Inn, and uh, Kath uh, Bygrave from Middle Temple. I'd like you to give them a round of applause before we even start. Thank you. So um, I want to also mention that one of my other co-conveners, two co-conveners um, from uh, Gray's Inn, Lady Justice Nicola Davis, and from Lincoln's Inn, Karen Shulman, aren't able to be here. Uh, but I do have the support of my colleague co-convener from Inner Temple, Leanne Mulcahy Casey, who's sitting at the back. And I'm delighted to tell you that she has been shortlisted by Chambers and Partners for the award for outstanding contribution to diversity and inclusion. And I really hope that she's going to win it because she really deserves to. So, so the first thing to say is it's really lovely to see such a range of people here to come to support the um, event in the audience. Um, and thank you for, for coming. Um, and I'm really pleased to see people here who are, are men, um, people here who are not black um, and even white men. Um, and it surprised me really when I mentioned this event to colleagues and friends at the bar and in the judiciary that people quite nervously asked, you know, is it for us, is it for everyone, or is it sort of a specialist interest event? And of course the answer is absolutely not. All of these diversity events uh, that ICAO and others host is for everyone because allyship matters and we can't do the things we want to do and need to do on our own. Um, so thank you. Um, ICAO has hosted a number of quite important and serious events looking at issues such as disparities um, in pay, the gender pay gap that we know exists at the bar, and also the very difficult but important uh, subject which is being taken ever more seriously now of judicial bullying. So, and serious issues aside, we also have events such as the very successful annual garden party networking event that draws hundreds uh, of women and their guests and their allies from across the board. So I hope that you'll be able to feel able to support some of our other events as well. But coming to this evening, uh, what hit us quite hard um, was the statistic produced uh, two years ago, which underscored sort of rumblings of concern that I'm sure we all share and some may have experienced, which, and it was from the Bar Standards Board, and it was a statistic that was actually quite arresting. I found really very upsetting because I wondered on a personal level how we had and what part each of us had played in allowing a situation to arise where our black sisters at the bar uh, were, it was evidenced that uh, they earn 40% of what their white male counterparts earn. And that is if you remove all of those different variables about age and seniority and academic background and uh, area of discipline, none of that explains the disparities. So we are left, it seemed to me, um, with a clear and reasonable inference in the way that I might direct a jury from this evidence, a reasonable inference to draw from all of that is that it is done down to structural discrimination. And let's call it what it is at times, racism. Um, so um, we thought we want to address this because we all have a, a responsibility in trying to address it. And it was very important actually to focus on black women rather than brown women, because although there are issues that face and challenges that someone like myself faces, uh, they are different and they are not, if you look at the hierarchy of things, 
as serious as some of the intersectional issues that impact upon black women. And uh, so um, I am absolutely delighted um, to be able to welcome this amazing uh, panel, stellar panel of incredible uh, black women who are forging ahead uh, in the profession uh, for the benefit of all of us. Um, I'm not going to spend too long going into their biographies. You've got uh, a, a booklet like this that shows you their very glamorous photographs and um, their detailed uh, biographies. But um, uh, just to briefly say um, that uh, at the end is Neka, and she is a recent uh, KC uh, working in, uh, criminal, in, in the criminal uh, jurisdiction, also undertaking court martial uh, proceedings. And we then have um, uh, Abby, Abby Bola Johnson, uh, award winning human rights barrister at Dow Street, Doughty Street Chambers, specializing in inquests and inquiries and professional regulatory work, and you'll see that she's also chair of the Independent Scrutiny and Oversight Board, monitoring the National Police Race Action Plan, uh, and sits on various uh, panels and, and uh, uh, advisory panels. Uh, and then I have Natasha Shotunde, who is also award-winning, honorary doctorate of laws. She is a barrister uh, specializing in family law at Garden Court Chambers. And you'll see that she also has a role um, on the EDI committee at Lincoln's Inn, uh, and she's an associate lecturer at Goldsmiths. Um, we also have, um, to, my, to her right, Barbara Mills Casey. Um, Barbara and I, I think contemporaries, go back a long way, joint head of chambers at one of the leading family sets in the jurisdiction. Uh, she's also the vice chair elect of the Bar Council, and she is going to be the chair of the Bar Council in 2025. It's incredible. Okay. I'm very experienced um, family silk. Um, and then to her right is Elaine Banton, who um, has been involved in so much work around uh, diversity and inclusion, especially for uh, Middle Temple and the Bar. Uh, she's a human rights barrister and an employment equality and discrimination barrister at Seven at Bedford Row. She was the Times Lawyer of the Week in March 2023 and uh, has given evidence in Parliament to the Joint Committee on Human Rights in the inquiry into human rights at work and various other uh, uh, positions that she holds in and around the law. So um, what I wanted to start with um, is to try and dispel uh, some of the myths <laughs> that surround these sorts of discussions and the conclusion of that particular piece of research that I've quoted to you about the 40%. Um, because we know that what we're going to talk about and the structural discrimination is beyond doubt that it exists and it is underpinned uh, by uh, this research and empirical data. Uh, because I don't know if you share this, but my experience is that even more so than in relation to gender discrimination and gender abuse, in respect of race, you are still often faced with what on the surface looks like a genuine and innocent inquiry from people about a matter that you may have raised if you ever found yourself courageous enough to raise it in certain environments as something that is discriminatory and racist. Uh, and it's couched in terms of a general inquiry, but what in fact it is, is a challenge, challenge to your credibility in raising this when you allege racial discrimination. And I'm sure many of you will have experienced it. I know I have. Um, so you'll have those questions about, are you sure that that's what happened? I mean, think about this in a parallel with dealing with a woman that might have reported some uh, sexual harassment or, or abuse. Are you sure that's what happened? Have you misinterpreted it because you're a bit over-emotional or a bit chippy? Um, did they mean it? Is there an innocent explanation for what happened? Or are you exaggerating and embellishing it because you're a bit over-emotional about these matters? Or sometimes even more offensively, 
Is there anything you may have done that has led to this situation so that somehow you are culpable for what someone else has done and that the response to what you have done is because you have acted improperly and somehow the response is justified. And so because of those sorts of questions and myths and undermining and what I call actually gaslighting about race, um, I'd like to start with inviting Barbara to contextualize the discussion that's going to follow in light of what we know has already been established as fact by, as I say, research and empirical data. Thank you, Khartoum. Um, at the start of Black History Month, with a theme of celebrating and saluting our sisters, I hope you will allow me to start by saying I pay tribute to those women who tread the ground before us to break it, to enable us to sit here in this way and speak to you, and also to salute this fantastic array of women who share this panel with me. The, it is now a matter of incontrovertible evidence, really, the BSB data, the work in lives data, and also the research that underpins the race at the bar report, that we are as black women, both invisible and visible. So we're invisible in terms of progression. Um, there are still under 10 silks, black women silks in England and Wales. Um, there are 12 and percent of all barristers are family barristers, but in our division, there are two black women uh, at Silks. We are the worst paid of all uh, the uh, protected groups in general. We are the most bullied and harassed. Um, and even when you progress, it takes twice as long to uh, uh, attain your, uh, your progression state. There is evidence to substantiate the, um, what we've all thought about the allocation of work, which is the barrier to progression often. If you don't get decent cases, you can't make those applications and you can't advance. Um, and so it is a real issue and it, we, we are past the idea of scratching heads and wondering whether it is true. There are a number of different sources which will all bring you to uh, the summary that I have given you. And as Khartoum says, the difficulty is, it is hard to articulate that experience as you sit on a panel, for example, because you're, you know, people always invite you to doubt yourself, but the data is there and the data is clear. And it, we, we, we have to do something about it. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I can maybe ask Elaine then, just to start us off. You. That's proper sisterhood for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I could ask Elaine to start just by telling us a little bit about, from your perspective, what are the particular issues that face Black women in terms of disparity of work allocation, barriers to entry, retention, and progression? Yes. My, all right, good. I hope you can hear me. Um, really echoing what Barbara said, because those are the main sort of pinch points. So in terms of access, access now has improved, but the real issues that still remain significantly are retention and progression for black women. And like we've heard, issues around uh, the, the underpayment and, and on the other side, um, you know, the lack of advancement. I think there's a correlation between the two, you know, in terms of the way that we look at the allocation of work the way that black women are potentially perceived, perceived by their clerks, perceived by judges, perceived even by clients. There are many, many stories and anecdotes, anecdotes we can all tell involving all three of those groups where um, black women are not perceived as properly being in that space and effectively having to work, you know, twice as hard. And it's an old ad adage that you know, we, we hear as we're growing up um, that's still said today about having to work harder and, and things taking longer. So I think this is one of the aspects is, is the perception um, in respect of black women. And what's so important about when you do have 
black women being successful is that they are breaking down those barriers and they should be and must be celebrated as role models, as showing society that yes, we can do it. And not only do it, we can absolutely knock it out of the park and get excellent results. When we are given a fair chance, nobody's asking for favors. We're asking for equality. It should not be a radical thing. But I think we all have a part to play in that story and to challenge our own perceptions. How many of us have done the Harvard bias implicit test? I think it's a good one to do because you'll probably find that you have got implicit biases. Everybody does. And if, you are a if you're sitting as a judge, if you're allocating work, if you're relating with clients or whatever, you may be you know, actually passing on those biases which are going to affect somebody's career. So it's vitally important that we all think about these issues. Um, and it, for example, if you're leading, if you're a leader, how many black women have you led? Really, think about that. I'll leave you on that point. Thank you. Um, Abby, do you want to come in on, on those issues? Yeah, so I always think it's really interesting, especially when we're at events like this, where the majority of the audience are the demography that we're speaking about, to actually kind of spin it and to talk about these issues, but what positive aspects have we seen and how do we think that we've navigated it as a panel? I think it's safe to say that we've all done quite well career-wise at the bar. So when we were, oh, it's always one person who has an echo, it's always me. Um, when we were talking, oh my God. There's a video of the microphone. Echo. Okay, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I always like to think of it, I'm just going to switch off because it's annoying me. I always like to think of it from the other perspective of what has gone well. And if I were to highlight the points in my career that I think have assisted me to progress, and then when I read the reports, I think, oh, this is why actually I was kind of shielded from some of these things, or this is the point at which things turned around for me. I think Tash and I are quite lucky in terms of the generation that we belong to from coming into the bar. I have black women above, horizontal and below me. So when I went into my main set of chambers, uh, which was 25 Bedford Row, where I spent the majority of my career, I walked into a set of chambers that had Laurie-Anne Power, who's now a, a KC, Melanie Simpson, who's now a KC, Emma Akarudike, Helen Valley, Cheryl Nwosu, um, who were all above me. And that, that was a conglomerate of black women who were above me. When my tenancy decision came up after my third six pupillage, they were championing me in those meetings. But not just them, I also have my people supervisors like Nicola Howard and Dermot Keating who are white, but who I'd spoken to openly about race, about some of my concerns, about how it felt to go into a courtroom and be one of the only black people there. I had really like deliberate conversations with them about the type of practice I wanted, that I didn't want to just do gang cases, which you kind of can be pigeonholed into in legal aid cases as a black woman. Um, so they made sure that I was exposed to white collar work. I had those conversations with my clerks as well. So when I started as a tenant, I went on secondment to white and case where I did a quite a high profile white collar fraud matter. I did a secondment with Kingsley Napoli, which is where I met Tash. So I branched out into professional regulatory work, which brought me a private stream of work and a civil area of work, so slightly away from crime. And I didn't consciously sit down and think these are the ways for me to navigate the discriminations within the system. But what I was doing was I was putting in these safeguards in my career and in that progression. But I also just had these sponsors and these champions who were fighting my corner and who were you know, specifically addressing race when they were doing so. And not everybody has that benefit. Not everyone belongs to a set of chambers where you have black silks or people who are on track to be silks. Not everyone has people who are your peers who you can share those experiences with and not be gaslit during those conversations so you're not just burnt out by going through your day. Um, so I always just think it's really interesting to think about it from, from that perspective. And I was able also to have those conversations with my clerks, mm. um, which I, if I'm speaking frankly, I didn't have at my first set of chambers where I did my first pupillage, but I then had 
at my second set of chambers at 25 Beth Row, where I did my second pupillage and I openly spoke to them about those matters. And I think that's something that's very unique to our journey as a generation. We're still kind of, you know, it's not perfect, but as I look at successive generations, now they have us and the generation above and so on. And I think it's, it's, there's a structure that's being built now well, uh, around that. Well, what, what do you say then? Um, this discussion is going to be by definition, really a little bit organic um, because there are so many intersecting issues. When we talk about intersectionality, I mean, black women really are totally uh, primed in that position where there's so many differentials that impact upon them. But what do you say to people who would say to you, well, look, look at this panel. We have representation now. You've got uh, black women, two of whom are silk, you know, very successful juniors in diverse areas of practice, three benches among you, a deputy high court judge, the next chair of the bar council. So what's the problem? Neka. Testing, testing. I would probably say, even with that introduction, it's, it's not enough because as Barbara has said there we are still I don't even think into double figures mm -hmm. when it comes to black female silks and um, so in terms of of course a, a great panel of excellence if we can say here it, it's still not enough and it's fine to say it's not enough because uh, I, I just a uh, drawing from Abby's experience during pupillage, I was one of those individuals who was in a chambers uh, where I was the only black person as a pupil. So I didn't have the Lorianne's and the Emma's and the Melanie's to look up to and think, well, I could be there. And I also had the, the, the added obstacle, and these quite frankly were obstacles I put in my own way. I'd had my daughter during my second year at university, which by uh, calculation, I, I had a two-year-old during pupillage. So if any of you have started pupillage or are undertaking pupillage at the moment, you can understand how difficult it was to be a single mother of a two-year-old during a very demanding pupillage where you were the, oh, I was the only black person, only black pupil, um, amongst my cohort and it, it it was of course very difficult it was tough it was very tiring and going through uh, the bar as a black woman what you'll find and what I found was that there was an interminable mispronunciation of my name which really just needed a little just a little bit of care there was always, I mean, it happens regularly, you know, that I would be mistaken for someone else, usually Laurie-Anne, if she was in the same courtroom as court <laughs> buildings me, sometimes not even, you know, if, if she was there, or someone else whose name ended with A, began with A, you know, surname began with A. And it's just little things that if, if a, a little bit more care was used could be um, avoided but, but in terms of I'm probably going off into a bit of a tangent here but just in no. in terms of, of retention and progression that the race at the bar report was was pretty depressing reading but I think it's fair to say that for me it made me feel even more determined that uh, we should be putting ourselves forward for leadership roles because there's no point in, you know, in, uh, in complaining about it if you're not prepared to do something about it. And putting myself forward, I hope, provides the visibility for others that despite the barriers that we face, that we can attain the uh, level of King's Council. May I just say, that in answer to your question, um, well, here we all are, silks, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the problem? Yeah. Well, the problem is that it is to be celebrated that we can progress in the way that we have. 
and that is not in doubt. You know, I've won an election, I'm vice chair elect of the bar council and so on. But we have a problem for as long as the stats remain as they are, for as long as we are both invisible and visible, for as long as we can say as a matter of fact that black women get paid less than anyone else, then that is a problem. So it isn't enough. Thank you. Natasha. I hope you all can hear me. Um, I just wanted to add to that, that because I love doing this whenever I have talks, I've got the stats on black silks hot off the press this morning from the Bar Council. So as at the 1st of October, 2023, there were seven black female silks, 18 black male silks, uh, mixed race as in black and another um, ethnicity, female silks were four, uh, mixed black male silks are six. This compares to 339 white female silks, 25 Asian female silks, and the total number of silks in England and Wales being 2,052. So nobody can say that we've got representation. Nobody can say that we have enough because we clearly don't. Um, I looked on the way here in respect of um, the judicial statistics. As you can tell, I've been so busy with case prep, I couldn't actually put this in a proper document. I'm sorry about that. But um, essentially uh, the website had stated that, I think it was 50, right, hang on. I'm coming up to it. Essentially, black uh, candidates for um, judicial appointments uh, are overrepresented in terms of the numbers in the eligible pool, but underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in terms of the numbers that they, rec um, they actually recommend for appointment. The likelihood of success from the eligible pool to recommendation was 58% lower for black candidates than it was for white candidates. So, for, so there's a 58% less chance, I would say if I'm putting an application to become a judge. And yes, I do look very young right now, but I am old enough to put in that application. There's a 58% chance that I'm probably not gonna get it compared to a white person. So there's clearly some issues that we have um, in the profession. And what I would also say, just to, to come back to what Abby was talking about, about experiences, um, I'm really pleased that Abby had a really positive experience in respect to pupillage and having black people around her to support and uplift her but I didn't have that when I was doing pupillage there was only one other black person in my chambers and I barely spoke to her I love her to bits but I barely spoke to her I really spoke to her after I got taken on um I was lonely I was miserable I was depressed I was confused I felt like I didn't belong here it was a horrendous experience absolutely traumatic I'm out of it now everything's great but part of the reason why I set up the Black Barristers Network was because of such a horrible experience um, and from that I've managed to meet some um, incredible Black Barristers. Um, we all come together to do some amazing things and since then there's been other organizations that have been doing some amazing things. Um, one of the biggest problems that we have as well as those dreadful statistics and the structural racism that we have within our profession which is a reflection of society, is also a lack of visibility of these amazing, incredible women um, and others who are, of course, not on this panel. Um, people don't see us, as, as Barbara Mill says, unless they want to make a complaint about us. That's when we become hyper visible, you know. Um, so we need to be seen a lot more. Um, and one of the things that the Black Barristers Network is doing to um, create um, that visibility is a directory of black barristers so that everybody be able to see our beautiful faces and that's gonna come out soon. Um, because we need society to start seeing us as being barristers, being capable of being barristers, being judges, being capable of being judges. We need that sort of um, view of us to change so that hopefully those stereotypes, those assumptions that they make about us when we're giving submissions in court, when we're making applications um, to become silk, when we're applying um, for judicial positions, when we're just wanting to get a case, right? And, and, and our name is being put forward to the client with other people. We want them to think, oh yeah, she, she, she's a barrister. She can be a barrister. She's, she's probably capable. 
not those assumptions that they have of us that we're stupid, we're lazy, we're incompetent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Can I ask you something? <clears throat> My own experience is historically this was an issue. Um, how much responsibility? How much responsibility um, needs to be shared by instructing solicitors? Um, solicitors that do not look at diversity and try to proactively challenge their own assumptions and um, prejudices sometimes about instruction. Um, and sometimes, actually, solicitors of a black and minority ethnic background are reluctant to instruct black people too. And I can see a lot of people nodding in the audience. Um, and my experience was that they felt somehow by aligning themselves with white barristers represented something better. And because no doubt about the structural elements and who the judges were that they were advocating in front of, etc., that they would be heard better. And we also have to factor into that, I think, sometimes that lay clients don't want culturally matched advocates because of the small communities they come from and they don't want their business known um, uh, in the community at all. And they think that maybe the advocates would be a gateway for that. So we'll come back to Clark's in a moment. Um, <laughs> but what are your thoughts about that? And maybe if I can start with Neka. Well, I, well, I agree with, with it. So I can do something. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter. My daughter's now calling me. That that two year old. She's now twenty three and very annoying. Um, I, I agree with everything you just said, and I think solicitors do have a responsibility to allocate work responsibly, um, because there are. I know there are certainly instances where, for example there is a black defendant and solicitors unhappily would prefer not to have then a black barrister representing them. That's, it, it's something I've never really got my head around, but as you've said, in terms of, uh, they feel that the quality perhaps will, it will look better if they have a, a white male and it, it's, it's obviously plainly wrong. I mean, in some ways, it's part of the problem might be, my church, um, let me see what you think, that black women, um, black women uh, are instructed disproportionately in publicly funded work. So where you have city solicitors firms, because of the diversity imperatives that are in place for their commercial clients who insist on having uh, diverse um, lawyers instructed that that then ripples down but I don't really see that demand in publicly funded work so publicly funded work good thing or a bad thing Natasha publicly funded work is is excellent work it's the work that you know is for people that really 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 need legal representation in society I think I, I agree um, with everything that's been said in respect of um, commercial work and um, city firms having to show um, the diversity data of the people that have worked on their cases. I've spoken to a partner in Norton Roads who said that one of their clients literally sits down and looks at the hours that have been billed and is like, all right, fine, tell me who billed what. Because they specifically want to know whether those um, ethnic minority solicitors that were put forward to try and pitch for the case are actually working on the case. We don't have that um, for us, which I think is a big problem. Um, I mean, on a personal level, I was working on the Damien de Dobbs review for two years, I think, and I finished that in May 2023. Um, I decided to take a break because I needed I needed a break before I really started to, like going on hard for the um, COVID-19 inquiry. Um, and then I came back, I'm back, ready to start court. Clark's like, cool, 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 cool. Constantly emailing me with cases saying, do you want to put forward for this? Do you want to put forward for that? And I was saying, yes, 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 yes. 
wasn't getting a single one for so long. And I sat down in my house and it got to the point where I thought, well, maybe I'm just not as good as I thought I was. And I just got really upset. And obviously in my mind, I was like, it feels a little bit racist to me on the other side. But I was like, let's not go there. Let's not go there yet. Let's just pause for a moment. So but your clerks were putting problem. you forward there. Yeah. Your clerks were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yours is a, an absolute explicit example of solicitors. It's the other side. Bearing responsibility. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, Abby, do you want to come in on that at all? Yeah, so um, so for the majority of my career, I did criminal defence. Now I've moved away from that into the areas which are listed in my bio. And I would definitely say that what you see in the public areas or what you see in the statistics is even within the areas of legally aided work, there's still a skew of um, black barristers moving towards the less well-paid areas within that remit. So there's definitely, when you look at allocation of work, there is a duty on solicitors, but actually also on clerks, which I know we're going to move on to, mm -hmm. who see it the other end to consider how that is being balanced, where that work is moving towards, whether or what they can do proactively as a chambers um, around those areas. So, you know, if you go to Southwark Crown Court and you look around at the council who are involved in cases there, which is obviously predominantly a fraud court, you're way less likely to see black council there even though we would point to crime as an area of law that is more diverse than others. So there's obviously a lack of that representation in higher, kind of more intellectualized areas of crime, because um, that's that, that, that sort of background. And what's really important with that is if you have a fraud or white collar practice, that is an instant segue, an instant avenue to get into really well remunerated private work as well. Even if it represents a, a lower percentage of your practice, in terms of earning capacity, that can massively inflate your income, having that ability and that exposure. And the way that you get that is to always have exposure to that throughout your career from when you're very, very junior. Um, so I think it's really important for clerks and solicitors to have that in mind. But I would also highlight that a lot of the black solicitors and uh, who I have worked with, they don't get instructed in those types of cases. So also they don't even, they also don't have it in their portfolio to offer to barristers, to black barristers. And I've seen both sides of things. I've seen black solicitors who make a conscious effort to instruct black counsel because they want to even up what they see. And I would say in particular, it's black female solicitors who I think are quite good at that. But I have also seen black solicitors who are unwilling to instruct some black counsel or would, hit, or would give the kind of feedback that they would only give to black counsel around things. Oh, I didn't really expect you to make that sort of a decision or to advise a client in that way. I thought you were one of us. And you're sort of like, well, the evidence is really clear that this person is bound to rights. And so I have a duty to advise along those lines. Sometimes you can feel this extra layer of kind of, of pressure to advise or to conduct a case in a certain way because of your skin color and you feel that it would be it would be tolerated or treated differently by somebody who had a different hue to you so it's quite complicated i think the way that racism manifests i think there are all of these hurdles and kind of mental calculations that we do as black counsel that don't even feature on the spectrum for for our white contemporaries um, which makes things you know harder you see both both ends and both sides of it but certainly yeah there is a role for solicitors to play around that 100 percent and there's definitely also a role for us to play in terms of how tactical you are with the way that you structure your career so whenever I talk to really young people who are coming through um, the bar one of the things I always always say to them is please just make sure that you are getting exposed to a range of cases during pupillage and during your first few years because the impact that can have later on in your career can be quite exponential even though you don't you may not appreciate it in those first few years of practice. On the other hand um, in the way that um, black women and black advocates are overrepresented in publicly funded areas of course the litigants are overrepresented as well uh, and so when I was asking about you know the positives and negatives I mean do you want to come into that Barbara about the value of having someone that looks like them represent them. Of course, there's a there's a, a natural understanding if you're 
uh, dealing with somebody who shares your culture and, and, and your heritage. And you can point out, and somebody was telling me over the weekend, I was at a conference and he sits as a judge and he was, he's a black judge. And he was telling me the amount of difference he has been able to make in cases, for example, where um, a black person is identified as simply IC3. Mm -hmm. And it is his experience of the shades of us that might question, cause him to say, well, help me with the shade of color of the black person, which will then help with the identification, something that isn't either otherwise raised by other people. But to your question about who is, who is calling the shots about um, instructions, it's also education for the clients because sometimes black clients worry that if they instruct black counsel, that there will be a skew in the room, that the judge would necessarily think, well, it's them. And so I won't pay them any attention. So it's about these conversations also going to the point of the excellence that black barristers have to offer. It's not all, always the negative picture. It, it's, the, it's the excellence that they offer. And I think if a solicitor is told, if, if a client says to a solicitor, I don't want you to instruct Barbara because she's black and it'll look wrong in court, part of the advisory work, you know, that that client has gone to the solicitor for advice over a spectrum of things. And it is for that solicitor to, to advise the client um, about the, the, the value that, that that barrister can bring to their case. It, it's not just one piece that will help solve this issue. It's everybody doing their bit where they are. That's what will move this on. Could I just come in? Sorry. We're we'll taking questions add, afterwards. If you're... All right. Add another category yeah. that seems to me to be at fault, and that is our politicians who perpetuate this myth that if you are black, you're a criminal, if you are black, you are a migrant and unwelcome. And if we don't get our politicians to treat us with equality, You've got a battle on your hands. I was Elaine. just going to say, as a civil practitioner on this panel, so I think it is actually quite different at, at civil in civil areas still. And it, yes, is what I'm talking about. So as an employment practitioner, I'm one of the few, maybe less than a handful, of senior black female, uh, you know, practitioners doing high level employment work just not there they don't exist and so this talk about magic circle firms instructing uh, black barristers I, I fear it's a myth I, i'd like to know where it happens because i i, I don't see it well, they, I, I don't see it and they couldn't if they wanted to instruct more than me because yeah. in family in the sort of family work that i do exactly it's me yeah literally and, but they are instructing you but outside <laughs> which is good yeah. but in civil civil areas employment commercial it's 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 even less um all right so um abby do you want to come in on that at all yeah, so, um, so for the majority of my career, I did criminal defence. Now I've moved away from that into the areas which are listed in my bio. And I would definitely say that what you see in the public areas and what you see in the statistics is even within the areas of legally aided work, there's still a skew of um, black barristers moving towards the less well-paid areas within that remit. So there's definitely, when you look at allocation of work, there is a duty on solicitors, but actually also on clerks, which I know we're going to move on to, who see at the other end to consider how that is being balanced, where that work is moving towards, whether or what they can do proactively as a chambers um, around those areas. So, you know, if you go to Southwark Crown Court and you look around at the council who are involved in cases there, which is obviously predominantly a fraud court, you're way less likely to see black council there even though we would point to crime as an area of law that is more diverse than others. So there's obviously a lack of that representation in higher, kind of more intellectualized areas of crime, because um, that's that, that sort of background. And what's really important with that is, if you have a fraud or a white collar practice, 
that is an instant segue, an instant avenue to get into really well remunerated private work as well, even if it represents a, a lower percentage of your practice. In terms of earning capacity, that can massively inflate your income, having that ability and that exposure. And the way that you get that is to always have exposure to that throughout your career from when you're very, very junior. Um, so I think it's really important for clerks and solicitors to have that in mind. But I would also highlight that a lot of the black solicitors and uh, who I have worked with, they don't get instructed in those types of cases. So also they don't even, they also don't have it in their portfolio to offer to barristers, to black barristers. And I've seen both sides of things. I've seen black solicitors who make a conscious effort to instruct black counsel because they want to even up what they see. And I would say in particular, it's black female solicitors who I think are quite good at that. But I have also seen black solicitors who are unwilling to instruct some black counsel or would, hit, or would give the kind of feedback that they would only give to black counsel around things. Oh, I didn't really expect you to make that sort of a decision or to advise a client in that way. I thought you were one of us. And you're sort of like, well, the evidence is really clear that this person is bound to rights. And so I have a duty to advise along those lines. Sometimes you can feel this extra layer of kind of, of pressure to advise or to conduct a case in a certain way because of your skin color and you feel that it would be it would be tolerated or treated differently by somebody who had a different hue to you. So it's quite complicated, I think, the way that racism manifests. I think there are all of these hurdles and kind of mental calculations that we do as black counsel that don't even feature on the spectrum for, for our white contemporaries, um, which makes things you know, harder. You see both, both ends and both sides of it. But certainly, yeah, there is a role for solicitors to play around that 100%. And there's definitely also a role for us to play in terms of how tactical you are with the way that you structure your career. So whenever I talk to really young people who are coming through um, the bar, one of the things I always, always say to them is, please just make sure that you are getting exposed to a range of cases during pupillage and during your first few years, because the impact that, that can have later on in your career can be quite exponential, even though you, don't, you may not appreciate it in those first few years of practice. On the other hand, um, in the way that um, black women and black advocates are overrepresented in publicly funded areas, of course, the litigants are overrepresented as well. Uh, and so when I was asking about, you know, positives and negatives, I mean, do you want to come into that, Barbara, about the value of having someone that looks like them represent them? Of course, there's a, there's a, a natural understanding if you're uh, dealing with somebody who shares your culture and, and, and your heritage, and you can point out, and somebody was telling me over the weekend, I was at a conference and he sits as a judge and he was, he's a black judge, and he was telling me, the amount of difference he has been able to make in cases, for example, where um, a black person is identified as simply IC3. Mm -hmm. And it is his experience of the shades of us that might question, cause him to say, well, help me with the shade of color of the black person, which will then help with the identification, something that isn't either otherwise raised by other people. But to your question about who is, who is calling the shots about, um, instructions it's also education for the clients because sometimes black clients worry that if they instruct black counsel that there will be a skew in the room that the judge would necessarily think well it's them and so i won't pay them any attention so it's about these conversations also going to the point of the excellence that black barristers have to offer it's not always the negative picture it's the it's the excellence that they offer and I think if a solicitor is told, if, if a client says to a solicitor, I don't want you to instruct Barbara because she's black and it'll look wrong in court, part of the advisory work, you know, that that client has gone to the solicitor for advice over a spectrum of things. And it is for that solicitor to, to advise the client um, about the, the, the value that, that that barrister can bring to their case. It, it's not just one piece that will help solve this issue. It's everybody doing their bit where they are. That's what will move this on. Well, could I just come in? Sorry. Yeah. We're taking questions add, afterwards. If you... All right. Add another category yeah. that seems to me to be at fault, and that is our politicians who perpetuate 
this list that if you are black, you're a criminal. If you are black, you are a migrant and unwelcome. And if we don't get our politicians to treat us with equality, you've got a battle on your hands. I was just going to say, as a civil practitioner on this panel, so I think it is actually quite different at, at civil, in civil areas still. And it, yes, is what I'm talking about. So as an employment practitioner, I'm one of the few, maybe less than a handful of senior black female, uh, you know, practitioners doing high level employment work. They're just not there. They don't exist. And so this talk about magic circle firms instructing at black barristers, I fear it's a myth. I'd like to know where it happens because I, I don't see it. Well, I, they, I don't see it. And they couldn't if they wanted to instruct more than me because yeah. in family, in the sort of family work that I do, exactly, it's me. Yeah, literally. And, but they are instructing you. But outside, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. But in civil, civil areas, employment, commercial, it's 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 even less so i do and, and and then look at the set so this is how it works they are married to particular sets this is what it is in civil employment those areas some of those sets have never to this day never had a black barrister in those chambers not even i am against people. those chambers that people that alone are black they have maybe they've had yeah. people they've never been taken on yeah. and i'm against those sets all the time they've never had a black barrister they may have had an asian one they may have asians they do not have any black women or black men maybe they've got one black man but no black women so that tells a story because if they are instructing particular sets and those sets are not you know i think there's an issue i think about this because because i do wonder why that is the case why is that um and i think you know it's a bit of a chicken and egg but more needs to be done about that because it would seem to me that some of yes. these spaces are not very just inclusive. Happy. Yeah, I'm I mean, happy. just building what you said, Elaine, talking to my cohort of people from bar schools, I was called to the bar in 2011. When you swap war stories, as, as you know, we often do, I have to say some of the most, just most disgusting, overt racism based in court is my civil colleagues. Like the stuff that they, that is said to them by judges, by clients, is like absolutely abhorrent compared to I, what I think sometimes I guess because in crime they're a bit more aware of the fact that there are more of us there the racism is still there but it's not as disgustingly over as some of the stories that I've heard from my friends in commercial like you know judges overtly expressing surprise that the council in front of them is black and saying to them after submissions, you know, oh, congratulations, that was extremely eloquent, particularly from you know, someone of your background and so on, and asking them questions about their background. And I'll be like, oh, when was this? Two weeks ago. I'm like, are you for real? Like, you know, like, I think like some of the, just even the types of racism that you see that exposure to. And yeah, I mean, I, I think also in fairness to Tash, Tash gave that ex um, example of the partner at Norton Rose and talking about their client, but we both sit on the Black Barristers Network Committee. And certainly I think that some of these more commercial um, groups are better at giving a veneer of considering diversity. They have whole departments, they have a lot more money that they can put behind these things, but you rarely see it in the fruition of their work. So on either end, I don't think any aspect of the profession is getting it right. Okay, well, can I just ask you then to move on to just discussing what's going wrong in the clerk's room, even now, all these years on, what's going wrong? Well, clerk's room like mine and um, probably like many clerks rooms across the country there is uh, a palpable lack of diversity in the clerks room I think I know of possibly one senior clerk who is at Garden Court I might be um, 
might be yeah what one senior clerk that i know of certainly there's one i think chambers director at cloisters as well which obviously is a very good set but um the reality is is that if there is a lack of diversity which th there clearly is that there may well be a lack of understanding and um ob obviously from the race at the bar report that was one of the recommendations that should be tackled in terms of culture that there really does need to be a change in the structure of the clerk's room so that fairer allocation of work um, can be uh, made and certainly more understanding about different cultures the different barristers that they're actually clerking but if you're in a set that is progressive like yours natasha yeah, I mean, they hold themselves out as being progressive, and that's that's the whole shtick. If you are getting solicitors, um, if you are getting a situation where your clerks are putting you forward for a range of work and you are never getting instructed, what is it that needs to be done by your head of chambers or your barristers, uh, colleagues in chambers to get you that brief? I think a conversation needs to happen. I think the first thing that needs to happen is a conversation with um, the clerks, as in myself and the clerks. And then perhaps maybe um, they need to sort of sit down and have a, have a, have a think about what's happening and why. Um, the thing about the bar is that when it comes to the allocation of work, it's always been shrouded in mystery. We have no idea how it actually works. The, the first time I found out how it actually works was when um, the clerks accidentally like forwarded me an email chain from the system. And I was scrolling down and I could see that like they'd put forward like three names as my old chambers. Um, the solicitors chose um, Catherine, who's currently my current chambers, funny enough, obviously she's white. Um, she was unavailable now. So then it was just like, oh, fine, I haven't touched <laughs> thing. So I found out that way. Did I break this? No. Um, so... I think it's going to have to be a question of sitting down and literally asking them, so who did you put forward? You know, what did they look like? Um, in terms of the response, like who ended up getting that case in particular, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, a lot of chambers, um, well, all chambers are meant to monitor um, their allocation of work, particularly the work that comes in without having a specific person's name on it. So mm. the sister's coming in and saying, hey, I need someone to do this case who's available rather than I want Natasha to do X, right? Um, and I think um, some chambers don't do that. Um, I have been in places and seen that it's not been done. Um, and they've been a bit confused about how to how to do it. Um, the Bar Council, I am an elected member of the Bar Council. I think I was elected in 2019, so I've been in it for a while. Um, they have produced with the wonderful work of Elaine, who chairs the Equality, Diversity and Social Mobility Committee, um, some guides for um, chambers to monitor the allocation of work by um, gender and also by race. Um, so let's just cut across you, but one of the things that came out of earlier events that um, we did with ICOL uh, was that it wasn't just about the allocation of cases, because that's quite easy to track. It was about keeping a record of every single opportunity, yeah. whether that's the speaking engagement or a seminar or a yeah. social event, because we know that those lead to work and that every single opportunity ought to be recorded so that there is transparency. And the other thing was also possibly uh, about having some transparency about um, uh, publishing earnings. Yeah, I know. I agree. Without necessarily attributing to individuals, there are ways and ways of doing it. But is that something that anyone along here has taken up? Because that's recommendations that were discussed at an ICAO event, I think, about 18 months ago. I know I know someone from um, a few years ago, we were talking, he's at a commercial set and they post everyone's earnings on a board. I love it. They post everyone's earnings on a board so you can look at it and you can see what everyone's earning and you can be like, right, I need to improve here, I need to improve there. And then also in his diary, it also states why the um, solicitor decided to choose him over others. So for example, he was quite junior at the time and he was like, most of the time, the answer was cost because <laughs> I'm cheap because I'm junior but um yeah that kind of transparency is necessary for those of you who aren't who are yet to um start 
um, at the bar, we don't, most of us don't really have that. Yeah. Like if I think about the two teams I've been at, I've never ever seen a, re a report saying, this is how we've analyzed work. Mm. I've never seen it. Because what we found was that it wasn't just about you being junior. It's just that women were being farmed out on lower rates for exactly the same work. Yeah. And someone needs to take, keep an eye on that. Just but want to move it along a little bit, Catherine, if I may. I just, yes, I of course, you may. I say yes. also that um, I'm a great believer in the self part of the self employed when you are at this part of the profession. Um, I'm very lucky. I, I was a pupil in the set that I'm now joined head with, with Charles Hale. So my path has been smooth in that sense. And it's a very good set and we get plenty of work. I also have an extremely good relationship with my clerks, but I haven't relied on my clerks for everything. I've actually decided where do I want to go and mapped out for myself because that is the relevance of the self bit of the self-employed. To that part of the yeah. strategy. I think it's very important that if you're young and yet to come in that we're throwing doom at you and you'd be thinking, what on earth would I have in hemorrhaged all this money to qualify? What on earth am I going to be doing here? And I don't think you should despair because there are lots of tricks um, to navigate the system in order to make uh, a profitable career. Can we come to that then? Because last night I watched a documentary, I don't know if any of you did, and it was about black um, uh, doctors. And it was so refreshing to see black doctors, not just white and Asian doctors, including a woman who was a surgeon in the 1950s, I think who'd come over uh, from Jamaica, I think it was. And this thing about, you know, sisters doing it for themselves. Um, there was a young male doctor who noticed during his training that the diagnosis of skin complaints in black patients was based entirely on learning of um, diagnosis of skin complaints in white people and how things were misdiagnosed or diagnosed late so that the patients weren't getting timely treatment. And what he did was to go ahead and develop um, some app, I think it was, or some online resource that would help people to identify all of that. So um, I, I just would like you all to look at the positives now about strategies for the future and what black women can do themselves to drive change and assume leadership. Um, is there still a need, for example, because sometimes a lot of people criticize um, the existence of special interest groups like a Black Barristers Network. So um, shall I come first to who was, Elaine probably hasn't spoken. Um, oh, yes. So first of all, I think um, these networks have still have a very important part to play. I mean, that's borne out by the statistics. Um, we've still got a long way to travel to get anything that resembles true representation. And we know, don't we, that a strong bar is reflective of all the rich and diverse talent in the society that it serves. And that's integral to the rule of law, to agency and all of those things that underpins justice. So if we accept that, we've got a long way to go. And those groups are really good. They are edifying, they are supportive, they build networks. And for me, as someone who built a specialist practice, um, from a standstill position in a non-specialist set, relationship building is absolutely key. Because if it is harder work, but if you can build those relationships, they can last. I've got sisters that have instructed me for over 20 years. Um, and, 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 and when you do that, the return on that is the resilience, which is very key as well. So you'll be able to be well equipped to, to weather the storm. There was a time in employment law when cases dropped to, by oh, 80% when fees were introduced. And I was able to survive because I had built my own practice and I was established. So it does mean spending more time with your profile and building those, those relationships, but it will stand in good stead in terms of your practice. So Barbara, we've spoken a lot about the traps. Uh, just give us a couple of those tips about navigating that space. 
can only tell you what's worked for me. And I think that it's starting off by mapping out the sort of career that you would like, the areas of work you'd like, if it was, if it was within your gift. And then looking at how you, never mind, no one, imagine that no one was going to come and rescue you, which has always been my motto. What can I do for myself? Where is the work? What can I do to meet somebody? If I'm introduced to that person, what, how can I change that into work? Do I offer a seminar? Do, you know, do I do an article? Whatever it is. So, and being in charge of that and having agency for that has just proved invaluable to me because I think then it inspires me to work really hard for myself. And that is the whole point of being self-employed. It's not easy. I'm not sitting here saying it's easy, but it's very worthwhile and it's the only way. And if you have your own hand in it, then it matters little what your clerk does if your clerk's room is blocking you. Because in the end, if you forge relationships with people who are instructing you, they'll instruct you in your name. It doesn't matter what your clerk's doing there. The other thing that is often missed is direct access. Because we are first and foremost a referral profession. But if you manage to get um, a direct access work, it has many benefits because you get paid up front for a start. I mean, it is also an area that is fertile ground for complaint. Um, so, so you have to be careful. And, and what I would suggest is that you always try and have somebody with you, um, either a paralegal from if you're lucky enough to have access to somebody like that. Or I find a great resource, a friend of mine uses law students. Um, who are looking for exposure and, and entry into the profession and, and you can ask them to sit with you and they'll take a note and, and you're protecting yourself in that way. Um, the other tip that somebody gave me, and it's a long route, but she was determined and she's now a silk. She was determined to make it at the bar when she couldn't get pupillage. She requalified as a solicitor, built up her practice that way, came back and applied years later in other words if you map out what you want and you work towards it you stand yourself in good in good stead all right so natasha what advice would you give to younger black women entering the profession and and, and the justice system like my brilliant brilliant clark zakari who is here somewhere zakari Earl, who i couldn't function without um, and i brought her along here this evening because you know to be inspired by all of you, um, what advice would you give her? Um, there's a place for you here. Um, you belong here. It's a, it's, it's a fight, it's a long slog. And then when I look back to when I was um, applying for pupillage and getting rejected, et cetera, et cetera, I did wonder whether or not it was gonna happen for me, but I kept going. Um, just know that you're you're good enough in every aspect, in terms of barristering, in terms of life generally. I think when I started, there weren't many active specialist interest groups, as it were, like the Black Barristers Network, et cetera. So um, it was quite isolating. But now that they there are so many that exist, find them, find your tribe, um, hang around amongst your people, um, utilize that resource so that you can feel uh, loved, adored, and like you belong in the profession. Um, another thing that I've done is had um, a, a diverse practice. So when I started off, I did a lot of crime, I did a lot of extradition, I did a lot of land on tenant, personal injury, et cetera, et cetera. Then I started getting on the inquiry track. Um, I, I think it's important to sort of spread yourself out a bit because, for example, with me and Abby on inquiries, we get paid regularly, um, which is a problem sometimes when you're at the self-employed bar. Um, and then sometimes I dip in and do a bit of courts and I can get money that way as well and sit on other things too and I lecture as well. Um, so that way you're not just relying on the clerks to, to bring you your work so that you can pay your mortgage and eat. And by designer. Uh, and Abby? Um, I think you need to approach it like a business mm. um, and have a business plan. Uh, the, I'm embarrassed to say the first time I actually wrote out a business plan for my career was when I was applying to Dowsey Street last year and you had to do a business plan as part of the application process. And that's when I sat down and had to, as Barbara says, actually map out my career and think about what I wanted to do. I was changing areas of practice. I was moving to a different set. I was a, a new mum and so on. So I think 
approach your practice like a business and then you'll see the value in things that you do outside of the bar which may add to your career I think there's a specific trap that we can fall into as black women which is you can get really caught up in doing lots of free lots of kind of exasperating time-consuming work for organizations or for like really you know well-meaning groups that ultimately won't get you anywhere because they're not really that interested they just want to use your face for things think about how you can convert those with your career think about who you bring with you think about where you're spending your time think about why you want why your ambition looks the way that it does there's another aspect of racism that we need to be very conscious of which is internalized racism you can internally limit your own ability without even realizing it you may have convinced yourself that you want to be an old baby silk fine if that's what you really want to do but are you doing that because you've convinced yourself that you're not smart enough to do white collar crime or that you're not good enough to do human rights law so you're going to do crime instead which I do think is a form of human rights law but you know what I mean so always have that sense check and I think always also like look at who you're surrounding yourself with are you surrounding yourself with people who are strategic who are driven who are ambitious or people who are happy to kind of sit where they are and don't push you to achieve the best that you can you know I'd say like Tash and I have a lot of chats where we kind of tell the other person to fix up because we're limiting ourselves I'd say maybe I'm a bit more aggressive in those conversations yeah. towards Tash yeah. than the other way around but she's like my little sister even though there's only like two years between us but we're Nigerian so that could be 20 years so <laughs> <laughs> you know you need to have your, your people who kind of push you um, in that in that direction and finally and this is one thing that people never talk about please please look at who your partner in life is because people will drag you down you need to be with somebody who will nurture your ambition who will understand when you need to be protected when you need to be looked after when you need to be pushed and especially as women and particularly as black women you need to be coming home to somebody who who fills your cup and doesn't drain you because that will that will take away from your career if you if you don't. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I suspect my husband will feel tonight when I'm out again. He's nurtured me rather too much. Um, but Neka, please, your thoughts on that. So my thoughts are, my advice would be to be yourselves, be fearless, know that this is a profession where you are welcome. The bar are screaming out for people just like you. And... Um, the criminal bar, obviously I'd give a plug for the criminal bar. We would be lucky really to um, uh, get individuals who represent the composition of society. That's what we desperately need and can only hope that more people um, apply to become criminal barristers. Another thing I would advise is to align yourselves with good mentors, those who encourage you, um, I'm always guilty of, of, of overstretching myself, unfortunately, because if anyone contacts me, I will offer them an opportunity. I rarely go to court alone nowadays. And my, re with my recent trial, I had six young ladies from Brampton Manor who came and had a trial with me. You had half the jury with you. I had half the jury with me <laughs> who sat in the public gallery, had an amazing time, and now all want to pursue, well, they told me that, and I went there. <laughs> they all want to pursue um, a career at the criminal bar. And these are all uh, young ladies who, who go to a, a compre selective comprehensive school in East London last year, 92 of their um, classmates won places to Oxford and Cambridge. So uh, align yourselves with good mentors who will help you and guide you through. I always have a sort of anxiety about this sort of holy grail of Oxbridge for kids of a black and minority ethnic background, because actually I think what people sometimes overlook is, is the cultural challenge 
it, um, yeah. when you when you arrive when you arrive that there. does to yeah. you and your confidence um abby you wanted to come in on yeah. one thing this is the last thing before we wrap up i just wanted to say as well i think something that's really important is making sure that you find people who don't look like you who mentor you and who you speak to about career matters because also what that can help with is realizing that some of the reflections or concerns that we have as black women are not unique to us, that even those people who look like the traditional barrister go through those, those thought press processes as well. Um, obviously, it can be hard to find those people, but I have found that actually it can be nice to, to hear a privileged white male tell me that they have you know, some second thoughts. I'm just like, okay, cool. <laughs> so maybe it's a human thing. Different degrees of, of, of it, but it's nice to hear you, you know, be human and flawed. Yeah. So, yeah. Although it's always, um, it's always quite concerning when they get into a whole oppression Olympics yeah. with you <laughs> about how they might have suffered. Um, but anyway, um, look, unless anyone's got any burning questions, I wonder if it'd be okay for us to move um, to drinks where we can network and talk. But if you do, we did say we'd allow some room for questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. There's a mic, there's one got a roving mic. Just one moment, thank you. <laughs> I would just like to ask, are you all London based? Yeah. yeah. Because, okay. Um, because I, my perception is that London is a lot more open um, and there is a lot more opportunity for people of ethnic backgrounds. Um, I live in Leeds, although I'm a Londoner, and my observations of representation outside of London um, are very concerning. So is this something that is also being considered because not everybody can or wants circuit leaders are all absolutely up for it because they understand that it's bad enough in, in London and the South East, but it's just terrible on circuits. And I will tell you, I'll give you the contact details for the circuit leader for Leeds. Mm -hmm. And you can say, I said, <laughs> he said he was open. So yeah, you all can right. speak to them. Anyone else, anyone else got anything? I'll take, yes. Um, well, this lady at the front actually, well, well, let's have this lady there because you're nearest with the mic. There she is. She's stood up. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for all of your contributions. It's been really, really interesting to listen in. Um, I think Elaine touched on this point, but a lot of these city firms focus on hiring or instructing barristers from commercial sets and have very strong alliances to particular barristers who obviously don't come from a similar background and I just wanted to know what your advice would be to someone like me who is new to a city firm although is starting to gain seniority and wants to make a difference in terms of who we instruct and why we constantly instruct the same men in particular. Absolutely so um, congratulations to you more power to you we need more of you I think one of the things is if you can, you know, be amongst numbers. So if you can sort of have a network of like-minded people in your firm who are having a similar approach to you, you're much more likely to break through that barrier than on your own. So I think that's something, you know, some of these firms do have diversity networks and I think they all should have. And if one of the aims can be to widen that pool and not just say it, but to monitor it, to regulate it, to review it, and see who is actually being instructed. Um, and so then to see, well, if you haven't, and the important thing is maybe to set a target, because then you can measure how far you've traveled. And if you haven't reached your target, why not? And that's not a quota, it's a target. And this is how things actually change, is you need something to focus attention and work towards. So I would suggest join with other people that, that are supportive and get that support. And hopefully you can make a difference because I think we all can. And I more power to you. Thank you. Anybody else that wants to ask anything? The lady at the front here. Do you want to... Someone got a microphone for. 
Yes, I don't know if that's working. Yes, what was it about? Thank you. So um, my question takes it a bit more superficial, if you will, or um, subjective as well. Um, I wanted to know how you deal with conformity in terms of representing yourself in the best way, but also maintaining your black identity. So in terms of even natural hair or the way you speak, I'm quite conscious of the way I speak. I'm from Nottingham, but it's not always noticeable in my accent because I've worked hard to make sure I enunciate properly or that. I speak clearly, which is a part of advocacy in itself, but then also taking it in terms of that, how that reflects um, from black people, it's often perceived as, oh, you speak quite white. So how do you present yourself <laughs> in a way that is um, putting your best foot forward, but also maintaining that sense of identity and then what part is cultural and what part should be, you bring towards um, your work? question thank you because it's really relevant something I'd hope we'd touch upon but we haven't had time um now who who hasn't spoken for a while Natasha with okay. magnificent hair okay 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 I have a confession to make um